уровень. This is the third of the series of uh, peace of, of uh, offering sacrifices to the Lord. Chapters one through five list the main sacrifices God wanted from His people. Each one's a picture of the Lord in some different aspect. <clears throat> Verse one: If His oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if He offer it uh, the herd, whether it be a male or a female, uh, some of them was uh, male only, and we'll see the difference here in a little while. He shall offer it without blemish before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall be, it shall take away. Just in passing, just in passing, that's why you don't eat organ meats. They will burn with the fire. They were not to be eaten. Um, how many of you like kidney pie? Blood sausage? All that European stuff. <laughs> Yuck. And Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire, it is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And if his offering for a sacrifice, a peace offering unto the Lord, be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. He, if he offer a lamb for his offering, then shall he offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering, and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation, and Aaron's son shall sprinkle the blood thereof round about upon the altar. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The fat thereof, and the whole rump, it shall he take off hard by the backbone, and the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards. And the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, which uh, with the kidneys he, he shall he take away, and the priest shall burn it upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. And if his offering be a, a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of it, and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle the blood thereof upon the altar round about. And he shall offer thereof his offering, uh, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covered the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away, and the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire for a sweet savor. All the fat is the Lord's. It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither fat nor blood. Lord, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you, God, that a lot of these offerings give us details about Jesus in the typology that uh, are not uh, particularly brought out in the Gospels. And we thank you for these extra, extra things we know about our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have, what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's a type of this peace offering here, or this peace offering is a type of the Lord, because he's the one that brings peace between us and God. And without him, there is no, no peace. So Jesus is God's peace offering. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Isaiah 9, 6 says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a uh, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, uh, the Mighty God, the, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So Jesus is the fulfillment of Leviticus chapter 3. He is the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 48, 22 says, There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. And so peace with God comes only through Jesus Christ. If you don't have him, you don't have peace with God, and that's all there is to it. That's why John 3, verse 36 says you're under the wrath of God if you don't have the Lord as your 
your Savior. <clears throat> now, a couple of sessions back, we looked at the burnt offering. And that's uh, dealing with, with the fact that Jesus is the life. And then the last time <clears throat> we looked at the meat offering, and he's the truth. And now this peace offering, he's the way. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So you've got to have Jesus if you're going to get to heaven, if you're going to get to God at all. Now, this offering, there's three uh, aspects of the character of Christ given here. First of all, it's an ox, verse 1. He said, if it be uh, of the herd and so forth. That speaks of uh, the strength of Jesus, the patience of him. It speaks of him as being a servant, as one of the Gospels brings out. And then there's a lamb, verse uh, 7, if he offer a lamb for his offering. Uh, that uh, speaks of meekness and gentleness, uh, which Jesus was to us. The Bible says he was dumb as a lamb, dumb before his uh, shearers. And then the goat in verse uh, verse 12, if his offering be a goat. Goats are despised and rejected. Uh, and so that uh, deals with the Lord's rejection. Came unto his own, his own received him not. And ultimately kill him. So, all right, let's consider the details here. Keep your Bible open, chapter 3. We'll pull some verses out of there and look at some things there and possibly a couple other places while we're going through. First of all, he said the offering could be male or female. Verse 1 If his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be male or a female. Jesus, like we've been saying, is our peace offering. He made peace for us, all of us, all humanity, male or female. Uh, he made peace uh, for us with God. Look at Colossians chapter 1. We'll come back to Leviticus. Keep your marker there. Colossians 1. I hear the pages rustling. I know you got it all memorized, but I want you to look at it, okay? Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him, by Jesus, to reconcile all things unto himself, unto God. So through Jesus Christ, God reconciled everybody to himself through the Lord, and he is the peace that God gives. Look on over Galatians chapter 3, while you're in the New Testament, or backwards, Galatians chapter 3. Now since the Lord is our peace, then he's made the fellowship between us and God possible. Otherwise, you could have no no fellowship with God, you couldn't talk to him, he wouldn't even listen to you without uh, this mediator between us and him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that was uh, Job's problem in Job chapter 9, I think it is, said there's no daysman between me and God. There's no, no middleman, nobody that can bring us together. Uh, but there is now, we don't have Job's problem. Uh, Ephesians 2.12 said we were aliens uh, from the things of God, but not anymore because Jesus is our peace. And because of that, in, in this fellowship that we now have with God, Galatians 3 brings us out, well, there's neither male nor female. So that's why it's brought out in that particular offering. Chapter 3, verse 26 of Galatians. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, for as many of you as have, as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now you realize when he says those things, he's talking about spiritual matters, not physical matters. There is male and female in the physical world, but not uh, in the spiritual world. There's the, both the same, neither male nor female, in the sight of God. So if you say you're a child of God, whether whatever you, you know, male or female, uh, even if you didn't know what you were, some people seem to have that problem. If you're saved, then uh, okay, you're part of one of his children. We're children together, children of God together by faith in Christ. Now let's go back to our text and see the second thing. Uh, this offering was to be without blemish before the Lord. All the offerings were. <clears throat> he says in verse 1, whether it be male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. It doesn't matter what people say about Jesus, okay? It doesn't matter. They can... They can uh, they can call him a, a prophet. They can call him a revolutionary. They can say he's somebody who died before his time. All the junk they say about the Lord. He was just a man and this and that. It doesn't matter what they say about him. God had to see him without blemish in order to, for God to accept him as the peace offering. 1 Peter 1 verse 19 says, We were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without what? Blemish and without spot. 
So that's the way God had to, had to see him. Uh, even the devils confess the, uh, the deity of Christ and that he's without blemish. In Mark chapter 1, verse 24, one of the first times the Lord runs into demon-possessed people in the Gospels there, uh, the devils speak back to the Lord and they say, Thou art the Holy One of God. We know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. That's why James 2.19 says the devils believe and tremble. They, they believe in the deity of Christ. They know exactly who he is, okay? They know where he came from and so on. And they've seen him and all that. And so they recognize the deity of the Lord. Well, the Father had to see that uh, without blemish. Like I said, regardless of how people see Jesus, the Father had to see without blemish in order to accept this uh, uh, the sacrifice for him. So, he had to be without blemish. The third thing we notice, uh, there, had, there had to be some identification. Look at verse 2. He, that is the offerer, the one who brings this peace offering to the priest, he shall lay his hand upon the head of the offering. What's he doing? He's identifying with that offering. That's, that's what that uh, symbolism is there. And so, the person seeking with peace with God has to, has to identify with the peace offering. And the peacemaker, who is Jesus in our case, uh, he has to be worthy of the trust of both parties to be accepted. The party who, who he's being offered to, God the Father, and the party who's being offered for, which is us, has to be acceptable to both in order for this transaction to take place and accomplish what it's designed to, to accomplish. And our, he's our arbitrator, okay, the one between God and man. And so he has to be accepted by both parties. Now, God has accepted uh, that peace offering. We'll see some verses on that in a few minutes. He's accepted the Lord Jesus. He accepted his work as the peacemaker. And when we accept him as that, that's when God saves our soul. That's when he brings us together in fellowship uh, with him. We, we make peace uh, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, as we read in Romans 5, verse 1 a few minutes ago. And so uh, that, uh, that's, uh, that peace is automatically established the moment a person receives Jesus as Savior. He has peace with God. Uh, what is it? First John 2 verse 1. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so there's got to be that identification with the offering in order for it to be fully used and accomplish what it's supposed to. Number four, there has to be death. Verse 2 again. <clears throat> he shall lay his hand upon the head of the offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Uh, Romans 5.10 says, uh, For if when we were enemies, that's before we got saved, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Uh, if we're saved by his life, then it's his life from the dead, okay? So that's why the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ for that peace offering to, be, uh, to become useful to us, to be acceptable to both parties involved. So there's got to be th that threefold thing take place with this uh, peace offering for it to accomplish what God intended to. Romans 10, 9 says, uh, if you believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. So it's resurrection life he's talking about there in Romans 5, uh, verse 10. And it's got to be there before Jesus can save us. Resurrection's got to take place or he cannot save us. Uh, that's why Old Testament saints couldn't go to heaven. We talked about that before. The blood hadn't been shed. The blood hadn't been applied. And that's why Jesus on a crucifix cannot save anybody. As long as he was on the cross, he couldn't save anybody. The, the whole transaction had to be accomplished, the death, burial, resurrection, blood applied, and so on. And so the, the life of Jesus Christ before the crucifixion, could I say reverently, was of no value for saving people. Blood had to be shed. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission, Hebrews 9.22. So it had to take place before there could be any salvation come out of all this and any peace being made with God. Now, what was it? What was his time before going to the cross? That was his time of testing by the Father. You can read that in Hebrews 5, about verses 5 through 10, somewhere along in there. That was his time of testing to uh, what, what did they do with the Passover? They set it aside on day 10 and day 14 of sacrifice to make sure no blemish, no spot, nothing on that lamb. And so the Lord's earthly life was his time of testing, particularly his three and a half years of ministry. From 30 years old to 33 and a half. From the time he was baptized, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon him. 
for the power of what God sent him here to do. And so uh, that was his time of testing to, from the Father to make sure I've got a lamb here without spot, without blemish. Say, so, well, God knew that. Well, yeah, yeah, God knew that. We didn't know that. We need to know these kind of things, okay? So uh, God knows exactly what you're going to do tomorrow, but you don't know. And he's going to let you find out. So we find out some things about Jesus here that otherwise we wouldn't have known. And so the Lord, uh, the Father, had him uh, go through whatever he went through to make sure he was a fit substitute, a peace offering for sinners to satisfy the justice of God. And it must be satisfied. Everybody has to go to hell. His justice has to be satisfied. Okay. So he's a lamb without blemish, without spot. Um, yeah, Acts 2, verses 23 and 24, it says Jesus was delivered by the foreknowledge of God, whom God hath raised up from the dead. So that, that part has to take place. And you know what? One of Job's, one of his complaints was that, that God had never experienced what we've experienced as human beings. So, you know, how could he help us? He doesn't know what we're going through. And in Job's day, there was a element of truth to that. God never had put on, you know, what that old Indian cliche put on, walk a mile of my moccasins, all that business. And uh, Jesus and God had never done that. He never walked in the shoes of man, never uh, done the things, uh, faced the things, the temptations, all that stuff that were faced. So Job had, in a sense, a valid argument, but he didn't know. God already knew. God knew. Uh, he's, God was saying, uh, uh, that's okay, Job. He didn't tell Job that, but that's all right, Job. I'll take care of that down the road. We'll get that fixed. And I'll go through the same things you go through, and we'll see what happens with that. So that's that was the time of Jesus testing to make sure he was a lamb without blemish, without spot, and come up to the cross and pay for our sins. Romans 4.25 says he was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. So no justification without that raising again. In fact, I think it's Romans 1 verse 3 or 4. It says he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. So there has to be death, <clears throat> number five. <clears throat> the blood has to be sprinkled on the altar. Verse two again. He shall lay his hand, hand upon the head of the offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. Uh, so the blood being sprinkled on the altar, that speaks of God's acceptance of the sacrifice. When the blood got sprinkled, God accepted the sacrifice. Hebrews 12 verse 24 says Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant and it goes on and says his blood is the blood of sprinkling. So his blood had to be sprinkled on the altar just like the blood of this sacrifice back here in Leviticus chapter 3. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2 talks about the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, it has to be sprinkled on the mercy seat. And we're going to look at some references to see that's exactly what happened. Without shedding of blood, we saw a minute ago, there's no remission of sin. Without shedding of, without sprinkling of blood on the altar, there is no justification. There is no peace with God. And no acceptance of the sacrifice. So let's look at some references. Go to Revelation chapter 11. We'll come back to Leviticus. Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> No blood on the altar, and no acceptance of the sacrifice. Okay, uh, Revelation 11, verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple, what? The ark of his testament. It's called the ark of the testimony back in the Old Testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hell. Sorry, Indiana Jones did not find the Ark of the Covenant. It is not on this planet. Regardless, you can get on, you can get on Google and all that stuff, and you can have all kind of nonsense coming of where the Ark is hidden, all that stuff is hidden under Jerusalem in a cave and whatever and all that. It is not here. You just read in your Bible where it is. It's in front of God, in front of the throne of God, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what's on top of that Ark? The mercy seat. The mercy seat, which is God's altar. All right, look at uh, John chapter 20. So the ark is in heaven. It's in the presence of God the Father, right in front of him. John 20, <coughs> verse 17. And this is uh, after the Lord's resurrected, and Mary sees him. Verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, 
Touch me not. Why not? For I'm not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father to my God, and your God. So he wouldn't let Mary touch him when she first saw him. She's the first one to see him. Wouldn't let her touch him because he's not yet ascended to his Father. Look at Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28. So what are we doing? We're comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The Bible says study itself. Matthew 28, verse 9. Now this is... Later in the same day that he was resurrected, Mary's mentioned in verse 1 there, and he's going down to verse, uh, verse 9. Uh, and as they went to tell his disciples, tell him they'd seen Jesus, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail, and they came and hailed him by the feet and worshipped him. Well, a little earlier he told Mary, he said, Don't touch me, I'm not yet a sin father. And now he appears to somebody else a little while later in the same day, and they do touch him. They hold him by the feet. Look back at John again, chapter 16. John 16. John 16. In John 16, the Lord is talking to the disciples the night before the crucifixion. And in verse 16, 16, 16, he tells them a little while and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me. What is all this about? Because I go to the Father. A little while is coming on, and you're not going to see me. I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be with the Father. Then a little while, you're going to see me again. He tells them. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9. If the blood's not on the altar, the sacrifice is not accepted. Hebrews 9, <clears throat> verse 12. 9, 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his, Jesus, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Okay? What did he do when he entered in once by his own blood into the holy place? I'm asking you. He sprinkled it on the mercy seat which is sitting on the ark in front of God. So when you call on the Lord to save you, He just looks at that blood and says the payment's been made, the sacrifice has been accepted. That shows God fully accepted it. And so He will save you for Jesus' sake. Not for your sake. Uh, what is it He says in Ephesians for verse uh, 30, be kind one to another, tender heart, forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you, for Christ's sake. All right, let's go back to Leviticus. So the sacrifice has been made, the blood's been shed, it's been sprinkled on. Uh, they always say, well, a priest had to sprinkle it. Well, what, what are you going to do with that? He is our high priest, Hebrews 7, verse 25. So he did the sprinkling. All right, number six, the, this offering had to be made by fire. Verse three, and he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. What does the fire speak of? God's judgment, God's wrath being burned out because of sin. And so his, his judgment and wrath had to fall on the offering uh, before the, the offering could provide peace between the offerer and God. Amen. We can have peace in our soul. That, that had to be uh, taken care of. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Uh, how did he do that? On the cross, uh, paying the price. Um, what is it? Isaiah 53 talks about that in detail. It says, Suffered for sins the just, Jesus, for the unjust, you and me, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Again, the resurrection is in play there. Uh, for him to be able to save you, quickened by the Spirit. So it's made by fire, this offering. And of course you know the verses, three times the Bible says his soul was not left in hell, so it was put in the fire for our, our sake. We saw that with the chapter 1, the burnt offering. Uh, so it had to go in the fire. Uh, number 7, uh, it made a sweet savor unto the Lord. That's a sweet odor. Verse 5, and Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt, offering, burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto 
the Lord. Now, a sweet savor is more than just a simple satisfaction. It's more just God looking and saying, okay, that, that, that doesn't work. That's okay. More than just that. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, the debt has been fully paid, and the Lord is our peace offering, brought a sweet delight, complete satisfaction to his Father. Uh, like a person feels when they get some great gift or something like that. That's the way the Father felt when this offering was, was presented unto him, the blood uh, applied and sprinkled on the mercy seat and all that. Um, and, and the Father was well pleased, in other words. Yeah. Uh, Isaiah 53, 10 brings you a little bit of that idea when it talks about he made his soul an offering for sin and said the pleasure of the Lord, Jehovah God the Father, shall prosper in his hand. The pleasure of the Lord. God the Father, he looks at Calvary a whole lot different than we do. You know, we see it as a hideous thing. There's somebody put to death in a horrible way and all that. But it brought a satisfaction to God the Father. Why? It was his wrath being burned out for sin. And you get in the place where it's burned out. It doesn't have to fall on you and so on. Okay, so so God the Father was uh, totally um, satisfied, thrilled, could we say, uh, pleasured, as it says in Isaiah 53, and he's going to be glorified throughout all eternity because of what his son did, his son's obedience unto death, as it says in Philippians 2, verse uh, 6, 7, or 8, long in there, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Uh, God says concerning Jesus, Isaiah 42, and Isaiah 42 is about Jesus. In verse 1, he says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom, the Father speaking of his Son, in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. And sure enough, you read in John that uh, he, had, uh, he was given the spirit without measure, totality of the Holy Spirit and all that. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2 9 says. And so the Lord was, uh, the Father was completely uh, satisfied, <coughs> delighted in what took place. Why? Well, it was a 4,000, a fulfillment of 4,000 year old commitment God had made to humanity, promise He had made. And God that promised, Titus 1 verse 2, cannot lie. Promised unto us eternal life, cannot lie. Okay. And by the way, notice one other thing while we're at this point in verse 5. Let me read the verse again so you see this. <clears throat> it says, um, Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Did you notice that the peace offering was placed on top of the burnt offering? Burnt offering in chapter 1. Burnt offering is on the altar. The peace offering is laid on top of the burnt offering. Why is that? Because peace can only come after the wrath of God has been burned out. The burnt offering taken place, burned away. Then the peace offering, um, um, you know, was consumed in the fire. Okay, number eight. The offerer had a portion of the offering given back to him. Look at verse, uh, look at chapter seven. This is in chapter seven. A portion of the offering was given back to him. Chapter 7, verse 34. <clears throat> 734. For the wave breast and the heave shoulder have I taken of the children of Israel from off the sacrifices of their peace offerings. This is thing, something dealing with their peace offering. Uh, and have given them unto Aaron the priest and unto his sons by a statute forever from among the children of Israel. This is the portion of the anointing of Aaron and of the anointing of his sons out of the offerings of the, of the Lord made by fire, fire in the day when, uh, when he presented them to minister unto the Lord in the priest offering. So sections given back, the, the breast of the animal, the shoulder uh, of the animal, that was given back to the, to the uh, priest. That's one of the places the priest got their, their, their livelihood and so forth, was from the offerings. And uh, that's really significant. Uh, the breast speaks of affection, love, and the shoulder of strength. And as spiritual priests, which is what we are who are saved today, 1 Peter 2, verse 9, uh, we're a royal priesthood. The Levitical priesthood is no longer in vogue, but uh, we are the priests now. And as those spiritual priests, then uh, we have the love of God, the love of Jesus, and the strength of Jesus uh, given to us. Romans 5, 5, the love of God is shed upon our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And Acts 1, 8, you receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So we have that, that love, 
and that strength of Jesus in our life. And that's why I can do what? All things through Christ which strengthens me. What is that? Philippians 4.13. Uh, because I have his love and I have his strength uh, available to me every day of my life. All right, let's go back. Uh, no, let's go forward to chapter 19 and show you something else about this peace offering. This is number 9 in the list there. Anybody happen to be writing it down? <clears throat> it was eaten on the day it was offered. <clears throat> this, uh, this portion was given. had to be eaten on the day that this offering was made. Chapter 19, verse 5. And if you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, ye shall offer it at your own will. It's a voluntary thing. <clears throat> this is not voluntary that you get saved. <clears throat> Anybody make you do it? No. no. Uh, verse 6. It, this offering, shall be eaten the same day you offer it and on the morrow. And if aught remain until the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. So he says, you eat it today, you eat it tomorrow, and if there's any still left over, you burn it up. Uh, don't eat any on the third day. So eat it, eat it the day it's offered. What does that mean? That means peace with God comes the very same day that we accept the peace offering, right then. You've got peace with God right then, just like you said in Romans chapter 5, verse, verse 1 and 2. And so receive him as our peace offering, as our Savior. And... Um, um, that very moment you got peace with God. John 6, verses 53 and 54, Jesus says this, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. Now, Catholicism is totally gone over the cliff with this. But the Lord tells you on down that chapter, I think it's verse 63, he said, The words I speak to you, they're spiritual. They're not to be taken literally. So how do you eat his flesh and drink his blood? By receiving him as your Savior. The blood gets applied. His, his life, his body gets applied to us. <clears throat> and so we have peace with God from that, that very moment. Now look at verse 7 here in chapter 19. Verse 7. And if it be eaten at all on the third day, it is what? Abominable. It shall not be accepted. Now that applies dispensationally. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. A day with the Lord is what? A thousand years. A thousand years with the Lord is as one day. So he says when it's offered, when was it offered? 2,000 years ago. When it's offered, you can eat of it the first day. You can eat of it the next day. But you cannot eat of it the third day. So for the first 2,000 years from Jesus being crucified, the blood applied, we can partake of the peace offering, but when that third day shows up, which is the millennial reign of Christ, it's too late. Right. You get saved now before you go to the cemetery or you don't get saved. No second chance after death. No, some people believe there's a resurrection in the kingdom. J.W. teaches this. Be resurrected into the kingdom and have another opportunity to get saved. No such luck. It's just the end of the road when you go to the cemetery. Either you're saved or you're not at that point. That's all there is to it. If it's eaten on the third day, it's an abomination of God. So there's going to be no, no salvation. That's why, what is it? First Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, uh, uh, my mind just went out the window somewhere. He talks about, uh, well, let me go away. Okay. I'm having a junior moment. I don't have senior moments here, but I have some junior moments. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Find the verse I'm trying to think of here. It's not coming to mind. Um, it's on down in the chapter somewhere. Oh, uh, verse 9 talking about the Antichrist who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and lying, signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They didn't receive the truth. They couldn't get, they didn't get saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So anybody's not saved when the Antichrist shows up and they've heard the gospel, they can't get saved. Their grace is over for those. There are a lot of people saved during the tribulation, but they've never heard it. And what do what the missionaries tell us? Two-thirds of the world never even heard the name of Jesus. I don't know how true that is, but a lot of people haven't. And they don't get saved. They can get saved during the tribulation. Anybody's heard of anybody sitting in this church who's not saved, and we get raptured out of here, you get left behind, you can never get saved. Amen. It's the end of the road. You can't get saved in the third day. All right, so it had to be eaten on the day it was offered. And, uh, 
And then the last thing I want to show you, it was eaten until the third day. We just talked a little bit about that. But look at verse 6 again in chapter 19. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it, and on the morrow. And if aught remains of the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. So the third day, point to three points of resurrection in, in Scripture. And uh, so we're to feed on the love of God. We're to rest in His strength uh, 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 of, of Jesus, our Redeemer, and so forth, until resurrection morning. And that's what he says in 2 Peter 1, verse 19, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Well, that's Jesus. That's Christ to you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1, 27, Revelation 22, somewhere in there, bright morning star. That's him inside of us. And he'll be, uh, we'll be resurrected when he decides to vacate this old body and get out of it. And so until then, <clears throat> we rest in him. And that, that's the onset of the third day. And then you don't have to worry about it anymore after that. And so that's when we'll see him as he is. First uh, John 3 talks about that. We shall see him as he is. For we shall be like him uh, when that takes place. And that's when we start walking by sight, not by faith. Paul says we walk by faith now. Uh, that day we walk by sight. We'll see our Savior. And no more, no more need for, for faith. And so in the meantime, we just need to be thankful. We have peace with God through the peace offering that got sacrificed for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should motivate us to good works for the Lord, to serve Him. Now, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you quote that, you know, by grace are you saved through faith. But verse 10 says the reason He saved us is uh, we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Um, and Titus 2, 14 says we're peculiar people zealous of good works. I want to just think about today. Were you zealous of any good works for God? Or we just float through it like a zombie. So we we need to we need to stop and think this. Matthew chapter six, five, chapter five, verse sixteen, uh, that the world may the lost can see your good works and your father be glorified. Every time we display a work for the Lord in front of the lost, not with anything in mind, the uh, purpose of, of all that business, but we're doing it for Jesus, then the Bible says God's glorified. When they see your good works, they see you doing things for Jesus. Uh, he gets glorified by that. All right, look at chapter 7 again. A couple of other little things here. We'll close chapter 7 of Leviticus. <coughs> Notice one other thing about this offering. Chapter 7, verse 11. And this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he shall offer to the Lord. If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil, uh, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour fried. And we talked about those things with the other offerings. Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. And so uh, the peace offering uh, without leaven, that'd be a picture of Jesus, no sin in him, what the leaven talks about. Uh, but the thanksgiving offering from the priest was with leaven. And what does that say? That says we still have sin in our life. We still have some leaven. We talked about that the other day. You have no need but to wash your feet. You know, we're talking about all that kind of stuff. So uh, that's why this this offering from the priest had leaven in it. It pictures the fact that we're saved, but we're not yet glorified. As uh, Jesus told the disciples in John 13, now you're clean, but every, every whit, but not all. Still a little bit need to be cleaned up here. And because we still have <coughs> sin in our life. We have peace with God. Okay. Almost fine, I wanted to. But if we want continual the Continual peace of God. That's Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Uh, turning everything over to Him on a daily basis. Casting all your care upon Him. Bringing, up, bringing all, your, your, all your requests and supplications to the Lord and all that. And then you have the peace of God daily in your life. <coughs> so we got peace with God by virtue of the peace offering. And we can have peace, the peace of God if we walk in His will and his statutes day by day and um, turn everything over to him and trust him uh, for everything in our life 
And so we can be victorious because of our peace offering. Peace with and peace off because of Him. Aren't you glad? Amen. I mean, without Him, where would we be? <clears throat> yes, people how they do it, and nine times out of ten, they say, Christians will say, you are better than I deserve. That's all of us. All of us have it much better than what we deserve. Amen. Uh, what have you got for Christmas more than what you deserve? Yes, yes sir. So, uh, thank God for our peace offering. By Him we have peace with God. The blood's on the mercy seat. When we, when we practice 1 John 1, 9, when we sin as Christians, uh, we confess our sins, He's faithful and just, forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why can He do that? Because when you confess your sin, all the Father's got to do is look at the blood and say, it's on you. And uh, he says, I forgive you. I forgive you. Real simple. Real simple. Even if you didn't forsake it, he'd forgive you. But how much better, Proverbs 20, 13, if we confess and forsake, then we have mercy. <coughs> so how do you know it forgives you if you don't, if you don't uh, forsake it? And you just confess it. Look at Psalm 78. I'll show you that real quick since you asked. It's not part of tonight's message, but you did ask, so we'll take a look at it. Psalm 78. Um, it's talking about Israel in the wilderness. Uh, in verse 33, Therefore their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble. When he slew them, they, you know, he brought all kind of judgment and chastening on them and plagues and all kind of stuff because they wouldn't do it right. When he slew them, then they saw him. That's the way people are. And they returned and inquired, early after God, and they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth and they lied unto him with their tongue. So how do Christians do that? Lord, if you'll deliver me from this, I will do such and such. And then they never do it once the pressure's off. But notice this. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant, but he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. For many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. He knows how frail we are. So we confess first time one night, he forgives right then, right then. Even though you might turn back that same sin the next day. Why? Because he's full of compassion. And he knows how frail we are and how weak we are and how easy it is for us to yield to this rotten flesh. So he forgives us. But so much better, like I said, Proverbs 20, 13, if we confess and forsake. Totally different situation. All right, praise God for the peace offering. Amen. Anybody learn anything? Get anything out of that? I'm telling you, there's stuff in every page of this Bible about Jesus. What do you say? The volume of the book is written of me. Well, there in, in Luke 24, when he meets the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, the Sunday afternoon of his resurrection, it says he began at Moses and all the prophets and expanded unto them all the things of the scriptures concerning himself. Boy, well, I wish we had that conversation. Wouldn't have to dig so much. He'd just tell us. Okay, prayer request? Anybody?